Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Kyle Mestry. Um, this is hey, Tom everybody. Dino as well. Yeah, we're good afternoon. We're here to talk to you about eBPF and XDP and how it will revolutionize the telco 5G space. And so this is our thesis that we have, and we're not going to read through this. We'll let you read through this at your leisure here as well. Um, but ultimately, we're going to try to answer this question at the bottom throughout this presentation. And Tom, yeah, let's I think we're, do this. we're pretty relevant for this, right? Wouldn't you say in terms of us being able to answer this? Yeah, we've we've both been, you know, sort of... Uh up to our eyeballs in, in, in and around this area for a while. Um, I worked on the first um, nationwide open source 5G uh, deployment uh, over the last like year and a half. Um, and then you've, you've spent a lot of time yeah. on EVPF in the last couple of years too. That's right, yeah. I mean, we've both worked in open source networking projects all the way back from Open Daylight. From way back when. Stack, open V-Switch, I mean, all kinds of fun stuff, right? And that's one of the interesting angles here too, is the open source meets, yeah. you know, uh, traditionally proprietary tech, you know, even though there are three GPP standards, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, the analogy here is very much like SDN was, uh, you know, 10 years ago, whatever that was, right. um, where disaggregation of the data and control planes had certain promises that went with it. Uh, that's right. 10, 10 or so years later now, we realize what we've got. And so we're we're trying to overlay that model onto what's going on in in five G. Yeah, and that's by a the good way. Um, sorry, well, I was going to say that's a good segue to jump right into to our stuff here. And yeah. so as as you're going to explain this slide to us, but I, but I, you know, when I look at this as someone, I, I think, well, can you explain how this four G is different than five G? It's it's a there's a lot of parts on here. Yeah. Um, the good news is that 4G and 5G are are very similar. Uh, 5G is is an uh, add-on effectively to 4G, with things like you know MIMO and more MIMO antenna and and, and certain other things. But the one of the more interesting things is is in the disaggregation of the components, and we'll get into that in a minute. But like uh, you can see the components here. Um, uh, you know, organizations like ORAN have been working hard to try to open up the interfaces um, between these different components to to truly um, make them open, so they could be implemented by different vendors um, or implemented as different software components outside of a single device box, for example. So I think, I think if we look at it from this angle, this is kind of another way to interpret that previous slide, but maybe looking at it almost from where would you deploy those components, that perspective. Yeah, and I think th this is also, you know, this is showing the diff some of the different options. And a lot of you have okay. probably heard about um, how a lot of these functions are moving to the cloud, even, you know, 5G, we've seen, um, you know, the, the you've heard about a lot of the deployments that are out there today, which are really on-premise at a, telco that's deployed 4g um what's happening today is as you can see in the picture some of those functions are actually um uh, being worked on to be moved into the cloud which is which is interesting but also uh brings different challenges <laughs> that's Just right deploying a single box again yeah for sure yeah for sure and I, and I think i think if we start to think about it in terms of you know, how we got to those previous pictures where you, you mentioned the word disaggregated a lot, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, how, how did we get here and, and what, where did we start to get to this disaggregated multi-vendor world? Yeah. And again, this is very much like SDN, right? I mean, you used to oh, look yeah. at, you know, a box from one particular router vendor, some you and I worked on. That's <laughs> so, right. So others, others, um, but the point is the stuff that was stored in that proprietary box and integrated together all i mean there's all of those functions you saw on the previous slides are all integrated in that single box on the left what we're doing today in the disaggregated mode is um and and in the open source mode as well um is putting that stuff on uh, commodity servers using commodity nix uh running essentially commodity top rack switches even um in that uh, deployment, but what you see the difference here is more, right? 
there's there's four things on the right and well there's more than four things on the right uh, there's, f there's four racks worth of things on the right versus one thing on the left and the question comes down to one of complexity managing that complexity um as well as the cost you know which is directly proportional to that uh, so that's something we'll get into why ebpf actually is is um is going to help this equation bring, so that, bring the amount of complexity down i think so that's that's our thesis remember i think we can do it i think we'll figure it out i think we'll get there and we'll get there right <laughs> but you know but when we start to look at this as well right here's another way of maybe breaking this down uh, what yep. we're talking about in terms of the different layers and where things might land right and and where they're going to exist when you get to that deployment yeah this is this is actually trying to show how that picture a couple slides ago was is now been exploded and what the options are to implement those things and you can see there are multiple vendor options at each one of these layers depending on you know not just implementing the kind of the straight up uh ran architecture the 5g ran architecture the 5g core architectures that you'll see in the 3gpp docs and whatnot but even the hybrid cloud deployments that yeah. were on the last slide and and, and the, that's the, the stuff i worked on that's really interesting but what you'll find in those deployments is that the complexity is 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 enormous um it's manageable but it's it's not free you know as, as somebody famously said you know there's no free lunch here so there's a you know as you can see there's a lot of vendor options but that needs to be managed that used to be kind of managed by a single vendor or yeah. a sing single integrator anyway with a few vendors now you know like the the deployment i worked on had uh, i don't know two dozen vendors um at the party you know and that was that's part of managing the complexity oh yeah for sure and speaking of complexity i think this slide as well you know we've talked you know on our podcast the net.lol a few times about um open source uh, uh, you know, both in terms of foundations and individual projects and the explosive growth of open source. And I think this slide, just in the context of 5G and open source networking kind of shows that explosion. I mean, look at all these projects, you know, across right, the these projects are supposed about. to work together. Yeah, exactly. In that right? picture above, right? So you can see my, my point about additional complexity. So this is just the software complexity. There's actually no hardware here yeah um which is interesting and that to me is like like you see the little oran box at the top that is maybe where we can do some uh software like the rf radio hardware um that's kind of one of the last bastions of the proprietariness in this picture um the one thing though i wanted to point out too on this slide is that there are a lot of projects and you and I yeah. have worked on some pretty massive projects in open yeah. source at LF and other places. And yep. there's, I don't know, a dozen of those projects on here. And those projects were hard enough to manage on their own. Now you've got to make them all party together. And that that's definitely a challenge in here as well. Oh yeah. And we, like you said, we've, even before this, We've taken just a few of these individual components and tried to get them to work, and yet yeah, that proved challenging, yeah. you know. But I think, you know, if we're thinking about it from a positive perspective, maybe the various communities and you know folks like ourselves, having had that experience in the past, maybe it gives us a little bit of an edge for some of this, right? Yeah, um, it's about you know managing managing the whole thing. And I mean, if you look, for yeah. example, uh, one of the things that I've learned through my experience with these different projects is that um the project is i consider the project a superset right of what you would want to deploy and like if you look down at the the cloud infrastructure box down there with the different networking options that are there nobody says you have to implement all of those things to make one of these deployments work in fact what we're going to show you is is you you almost don't need any of those with bpf that's right and in fact that's what we're going to talk about if we zoom in using my fancy pointer here on this cloud infrastructure. <laughs> and we start to look at some of those infrastructure yeah. projects, specifically on the networking side. I mean, some of these have been around for a while. I mean, Docker obviously has, but even Open vSwitch. I mean, Open vSwitch is over 10 years old now as well. Yeah, and uh, OVN, you know, OVS, yeah. OVN, FDIO, D, all of these things are are there, right? And they've obviously served a purpose. They've, they've you know, been successful as well. 
Um, but, you know, maybe can we look at something like maybe eBPF and XDP to slot in here? And can it yeah. help address some of these problems? Yeah, let's take a look at that. That's, let's take that, a look, that. right? So I thought I'd give a quick overview on, for anyone new on the talk to what eBPF and XDP is. Um, essentially, eBPF lets you run sandbox programs inside your, your operating systems kernel. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. It lets you extend that operating systems kernel and loading some, some code down there uh, in this sandboxed environment to be able to enhance it as well. Now, and even extending the NIC itself too, the NIC's right. functionality. Oh yeah. yeah, you can do it at all. And I'll show you in a future slide where you can load the XDP programs, but it's it's kind of up and down the stack for sure, right? Yep. Um, and I think the obvious reasons why this was kind of conceived and done was because of what maybe some people perceived as a slower rate of, of innovation in the kernel. I mean, obviously the lower, the closer to the hardware you get, the longer the lead time is to roll things out. I mean, you know, operating system updates. I mean, even just think about yourself, how many times has your laptop told you you need to reboot to update and everyone says, no, I'm gonna wait, I'm not gonna do it now. It's, at least twice today. At least twice today, exactly, right? And so well, that's- One of the other yeah. promises of this too is, is that, <clears throat> Is, is either reducing the overall cost of those servers in that picture I showed. That's like right. 5G deployment um, by offloading the CPUs and letting the NICs do things, which NICs have cheaper, typically cheaper processing uh, components on them, ARM CPUs and That's whatnot, right. GPUs. But, or uh, it frees the CPUs up to do more. And that's really important in like these 5G deployments where I got to remind people that not all of those edge nodes are in a big that's right facility sometimes they're in a fiberglass hut on the side of a road <laughs> <laughs> so power and cooling in space really matter you know and you can do some really interesting things with xdp for example about very precise control over which cpu is executing which right because you know, you might have a CPU, your XDP program's running right off of the NIC. You might want to save that CPU for the next couple of packets, but you can forward, you can you can redirect to a different CPU and continue to process that packet if it's something yep. you need to do that's going to take a little while longer, for example. So there's some interesting things you can do in terms of that power space and cooling. Um, yeah, definitely. So I thought- so Let's take a look at what that is. Yeah, we, I thought means. we could just jump through really quickly, you know, uh, eBPF really has three main use cases, right? So obviously networking, we've been talking a lot about, whether it's high performance networking or load balancing, um, you know, security as well. Um, how can you implement security at the operating system layer with eBPF? <clears throat> and then observability and tracing, which I think as we'll talk about in the future is pretty critical for these 5G deployments, I think. And it's one of the, the areas that it's, Absolutely. we've talked about where I think it's gonna be pretty important going forward. Well, that's, that, and, and where it really is insidiously important, I would say is if you go back to those slides I showed, you know, the software stack that that's we're right. talking about, you know, you used to be controlled by a single vendor who had insight and introspection built in. That's all right. That. And today, um, those things are a bunch of components that either come from upstream open source projects or from a vendor and integration and, and observability is, is, um, non-linear, non -linear. <laughs> so friend Dave would say. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, when we, when we think about eBPF, um, and by the way, this is, I've, I've reinterpreted this slide, but I, it's linked below from a great blog post by our friends at Cloudflare as well. You know, who as recently as 2019 have already made the claim that eBPF is going to eat the world. And, and you know, since then, they've, they, they're a great resource for eBPF. Uh, so I encourage everyone to go to their blog and, and, and they've got some great stuff on there. But if you, if you look at this, one thing that I wanted to talk about was, you know, you really can load eBPF programs everywhere. And so what I'll do is I'll start on the bottom, right? And we're going to talk about XDP in the next slide as well, but you can attach XDP programs, which are eBPF programs, to the network device driver itself. Um, you can load XTBPF programs and at the IP tables layer. Um, you know, at the TCP and UDP socket layer, I mean, you can do some really interesting things there with TCP BPF, some socket dispatch programs, and the exporter. Um, you can also do, uh, you can load things at SO attach BPF, which is at the socket layer. Um, one of the really interesting ones, which we're not going to talk about in this particular talk, but which I've done a lot of exploration with is the sock map 
stuff. And that's, that's super amazing because sock map, eBPF sock map allows you to take two sockets, for example, and then glue them together in the kernel. And then the kernel will just transparently proxy data across them. So there's some amazing. That's use super cool that. because that's again an operational efficiency that yes. you don't really need to mess around with. It's just that's set, right. Set up. Set up. Yeah, you you do you do the set things up in user space in terms of creating the sockets and then you just glue them together and and away you go. So that there's some really amazing things you can do there. Yeah. And when we talk about XDP though, in particular, you know, XDP stands for express data path, right? And it's really a way uh, to do high performance, it, it, to build a high performance and programmable data path uh, inside of Linux, right? It doesn't require any special hardware. Um, it does require some driver modifications, but the majority of the drivers that you're gonna see will have those modifications. At this point, they've been At this point, exactly. You know, it doesn't require uh, kernel bypass either. In fact, it's almost the antithesis of that, right? Because what you can do with XDP is you can process that packet right off the NIC and make a decision, modify the packet, redirect it, or, and even after modifying it, you can just let it pass up into the Linux stack. So you can still take advantage of all the other things the Linux stack is doing. Like for example, yeah. the TCP IP stack or things like this. So there's, you know, it, it really plays in concert with Linux rather than uh, being opposed to the Linux kernel, it, it, it's We're trying to step aside from it. Like the 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 other op the other approaches were, you know, avoid the kernel. This is work with the kernel. That's right, exactly. Work with the kernel. Take advantage of what the kernel can do, but allow you to build and extend on top of it. Um, so now, if we take a look at maybe what the current state of eBPF XDP programs and telco networking are, I thought it'd be interesting to look at some use cases. Right. So here's an obvious use case you can do with, uh, with eBPF and XDP programs, which is DDoS mitigation. And again, if you look at Cloudflare's blog, they actually talk a lot about how they use XDP for DDoS mitigation. And Tom, you know, as a 5G expert, I think you can probably attest to that this is an important thing as well in the telephone. Well, that's where, you know, a lot of the, the you know, the sort of broadband access has been replaced, you know, yeah. with, with mo you know, mobile access. And right. um, this is a thing that is done in those networks and and you know here's the other thing is that the mobile backhaul in in my example of the uh fiberglass hut on the side of the road the mobile backhaul is not always um you know a high speed fiber network sometimes it's a iffy microwave connection you know <laughs> and exactly you really clogged the network in and those I think, cases you okay. know to your point about power and cooling as well the earlier you can drop that packet without using as much CPU time in terms of this type mm -hmm. of DDoS mitigation, the better, right? And so I think it fits in. Or other resources well. too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, load balancing also important because if I'm not mistaken, you know, Kubernetes has Kubernetes entered into is... the 5G world. And well, Kubernetes is intrinsically, you know, requires a load balancer. That's right. And, and, and so it's a, it's a, it's an intrinsic part of containerized RAN deployments. Um, obviously not with, um, uh, you know, open stack based deployments with VMs, but still, uh, you know, you, even those deployments that I've seen have load balancers for the obvious reasons. Oh yeah, you know? for sure. And you can do some really interesting load balancing. Well, in fact, we'll, towards the end of the presentation, we'll go into detail about one of our favorites that everyone should know about using XDP, you know, high performance forwarding as well. I mean, clearly that's important. You can do that with XDP and with eBPF programs as well, and that's going to help your 5G deployment too. Um, you know, flow sampling and monitoring. I think this is pretty critical. I mean, you've got this 5G deployment, and like you said earlier, maybe previously you had a single vendor that was giving you some of that, but now with this disaggregation, yeah. you need to build some of this. Yeah, you could build you could build some of it to augment what you buy, um, or you you know. Um, and and again back to power cooling yeah ease of operation you know less is more um and you know loading bpf programs that can just do the sampling on the nick and export the telemetry is oh, a big win you know really without big. everything else needing to be there exactly exactly so let's see so i thought you know we mentioned this a little bit you know ovn as well um so let's let's take a look and compare you know what what an OVN architecture looks like uh, versus what you might do with an eBPF. Yeah, this is the the the, the typical uh, architecture that you would deploy OVN in, and 
back to the 5G example, um, you know, you, you you know the 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 OVN nodes themselves um, in a typical network, there are tens of thousands of these. So you got to remember, I mean, yeah, you know, we had we had a hard time making this work even in a data center where everything was LAN attached with you know high speed reliable you know uh, links. Um, now we go to these five G deployments where. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, there there are con either congested backhaul links. Um, there's always congested uh, by by design, um, but losing losing messages in this architecture is uh, tricky. <laughs> it's very tricky. Let's call That's it right. tricky. Let's call um, it tricky. Exactly. And then scalability. You know, because the, yeah. the nodes have to continually talk to the the controller and the and and so on. And um, you know, that's another scalability issue uh, that that you know we'll see in the in the next slide. Is, yeah. Is yeah. Let's let's not... look at this. I mean, th this is kind of what we envision. You know, you might want to build something similar using XDP and eBPF programs. And I think the main difference, some of the main differences are. You can use an industry standard KV store and message bus for this, kind of whatever you want to build your controller for this. The other point is you've got these agents, which are stateless on the hosts as well, and they're using these XDP maps to program the fast path as well. Um, and so you've, to some extent, you've decoupled things now a bit more, right? You've got the fast path running off of these math, uh, maps, and you've got these agents, which are responsible for populating the maps as well. Um, it's a pretty clean architectural approach. Yeah, and and there's two keys in there, right? I mean, what did we learn through our whole careers in networking, right? Working on the internet, what what are the keys to scale? Is aggregation and statelessness. That's right. That's right. right. And so, that's what we're getting here. Um, that's right. It's pretty good. Yeah. So, so let's see. So let's you know we're gonna wind things down here in a little bit here. So let's talk about some key components for successfully deploying uh, these eBPF and XDP programs. I think number one, I mean, as of everything, hire the right team, but there's some <laughs> keys to remember here, right? I mean, XDP is, uh, you know, it's 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 gonna be, you gotta have C programmers, right? I mean, a lot of this is all written in kernel code. I mean, yes, eventually there might be Rust, but for now it's C, you need that's some a really good point. You've got Kyle. to empower that team, yeah. And that's a really good point, Kyle, too, because if you look at the modern crop of, of coders, yeah, uh, they, they may not necessarily know C. <laughs> it's challenging, right, for sure. So I, I think that's one step, right? I mean, you got to ensure you have monitoring and, observ uh, and observability for the whole solution. Pretty critical on anything, but even more so for this, because the other thing to remember, you know, your packets with XDP, you're not going to be able to look at them with things like, you know, um, um, TCP dump and things like that, because they're not going to go through the Linux. Not going to the firm. So build yeah. that up front, you know, understand how upgrades will work with your programs. What happens when you detach XDP programs and attach new ones? <laughs> This is actually gets back to the the complexity point I showed at the beginning. Um, oh yeah, up, upgrades are very challenging in very. in a disaggregated model where you have components from twelve different vendors that all need to work in harmony together, and That's and right. also follow. Um, that was the and the other picture with the different open source projects. There's also that you know um, uh, harmonization of scheduling. That's so right. that when releases come out, they're all synchronized so that, you know, we can do upgrades in a uniform way and so on. That used to be handled by a single vendor. And now it's now it's not, right? Now it's and not. It, <laughs> and it leads into this, right? State is your enemy as well. The more you can keep things stateless, the easier all of that's going to be and, and that. And, and, and I think there's ways to do that. And we'll show an example here. Yep. of another program right so so charting the future of this what does the future look as we kind of wrap things up here a little bit right so how do we how do we see this going right well i think we we see this as ebpf and xcp allowing further disaggregation of things right decoupling more network functions into ebpf and xdp programs right and disaggregating those network functions even more running them closer to the hardware right scaling things thinking differently in terms of of you know how things work right and we kind of wanted to to leave uh, to leave you with this, right? Here's a great example. So anyone who's looked at Facebook, uh, uh, Catron as well, this is a great example of what we're talking about. So Facebook designed this load balancer um, using XDP and eBPF. And as you can see, um, and again, this was taken from one of their blog posts. The link is on the bottom of the slide here. 
Um, it's really great because what they've been able to do is they have a control playing inside user space, an XDP program that works in concert with the local kernel as well. And because it works in contact, uh, you know, in concert with the local networking stack, you can run the application on the same node as the back end, which is pretty slick as well. You yeah. can do direct server return, again, taking advantage of the Linux networking stack. It's a pretty neat way to do it. But you know what's cool here too is that this is, you know, harkens back to the control and data plane separation from SDN. Um, you don't have to run them separately. Everybody thinks about running these things separately on a NIC. The beauty of this is that you can actually start running all this on the CPU and migrate it out as you need to or want to, you know, and right. if you've got a small site, small site deployment or whatever that that's right, you know, only can run on, on a, you know, on a small, very small machine that doesn't, doesn't have NICs that are capable of this or not, you can still run this on the CPU and it works. It works. Exactly. And so, you know, we'll wrap up with this again. You know, this was our thesis. And I think that we've, I think that we've answered this. I think that XDP and EBPF yeah. can be a part of the future of, of, of 5G networks. And I think it can help to simplify things. Yeah, I think we've shown, you know, you, you, you can clearly see a reduction in the complexity, a reduction in the yeah. scale concerns, a reduction, you know, from state, a lack of state, um, and, and also operational flexibility. Like I was just saying, you know, you, you have a choice as an operator to where to run this, how to run it. Um, and you can evolve into it. It's not a, you know, let's flip over the whole network into, you know, using this or that. And, and that is actually, um, you know, gets into some of the other options that are out there today. You know, they require you to change from NV, uh, NVGRE to VXLAN or things like that. I mean, this, this just works, you know, which is nice. <laughs> it's definitely great. And so, you know, with that, we just like to say thank you and, you know, definitely feel to re uh, free to reach out uh, to myself and Tom on Twitter if you want to continue the discussion. Yeah, thank you for listening. And so, and um, so. just want to invite everybody to listen to our podcast uh, each week right. on the net.lol too. And Check I think we out. have time for questions after the talk. That's um, right. So stay tuned for those and come with your questions. Thanks thank for listening. You.